Welcome everybody to the Firefly Community Call. I, I would say weekly, but we have actually just moved to an every other week cadence. So welcome to the every other week Firefly Community Call. Um, just a couple of quick uh, announcements and status updates to kick us off here. Um, I will go ahead and start and I wanted to highlight just a couple of things. I'll share my screen to uh, just show a couple things here real quick. Um, so new in all of the repos now, we have uh, an updated list of maintainers specific to each repo. So, and the, the code owners have been updated to reflect uh, these lists as well. So if you open a PR to any of the repos, this if you look in maintainers MD, this is the list of uh, people that will be, uh, somebody on this list has to do the review and they'll all get notified. Um, there's also you know, expectations of what maintainers will do and uh, a formal process for becoming a maintainer. We are looking for to add more maintainers uh, to each of the projects. So if you're interested, uh, there, this is the, the guide on how to do that. Um, if you're interested in becoming a maintainer, I encourage you to definitely make contributions and if you're interested in making contributions, uh, you can look in the contributing MD, which will now link to our contributors guide for, uh, this is kind of a, a contributors guide for all of the different Firefly repos. Uh, how to connect with us, finding good first issues, uh, setting up a local development environment, and just kind of the, the semantics if, you, if you're new to, um, you know, if you're new to Hyperledger or open source, uh, there's you know, some, some helpful tips here. Uh, but the I, I can't recall if I showed this guide in a previous one, but this is a new guide and some, some new features in case you haven't seen it. Uh, there's some new features in the CLI that uh, make it a lot easier to do local development on Firefly itself um, and coordinate that with all of the Docker dependencies and that sort of stuff. So, um, if you're interested in getting involved, those are some, some great places to get started. If there's stuff missing there or you have questions, please reach out to me and I'd be happy to clarify things or add. I'm sure there's additional documentation that we need to add, but I just wanted to provide a quick update on that. All right. Um, it, in, other, in other updates, we are in active development on the CLI and supporting multiple ledgers right now. So. Uh, I've been working on fabric support. Um, Sakrut, who is actually actually joined us today, is uh, looking at supporting Hyperledger Besu as well. So some exciting developments going on there and uh, super excited for the, the collaboration with other members of the community. Um, so coming soon, uh, not there yet, still under heavy development. Uh, also wanted to let Andrew just give a brief update on tokens. Yeah, I can do that. Um, and I will grab the screen share from you just to kind of show a few pictures. <clears throat> uh, so we talked about tokens on one of the very first community calls back at the end of June. Uh, and we were kind of uh, presenting some of the ideas that we had for tokens and opening that up for discussion on how that would actually be fleshed out. Uh, so happily, the past couple of weeks, I've been able to make that kind of a primary focus, uh, getting down to the nitty gritty of writing up some of the uh, code for these. And I just wanted to share kind of where it's up to. Um, <clears throat> this uh, is a slide that we've kind of shared in a lot of presentations. And I wanted to point out that we had a few boxes in here that didn't actually exist until now. Uh, and now they are very close to actually existing. Um, so we do have one token bridge runtime uh, that we picked uh, an Ethereum-based ERC-1155 as the first token bridge. We anticipate many, many more because tokens are just hugely flexible components of a blockchain system. Uh, and we think there's going to be a lot of different plugins here. Uh, but then inside Firefly, we have both an asset manager and a token interface that are both these exact things are part of uh, pull request number 154 that's open right now. Uh, so if anyone else wants to look at that code, you can see how asset manager is shaping up and how the token interface uh, is shaping up, and particularly the plugin for this one token bridge that's already created. Uh, just going on to steal another slide that uh, oops, came out of uh, one of Nico's earlier presentations about the architectural layers of Firefly and the plugins. I just wanted to highlight that we've slid in kind of a new full stack here, uh, this kind of bluish lavender uh, stack. 
we uh, have a token interface similar to all the other Firefly core interfaces. We have a connector that connects specifically to an HTTPS based tokens plugin. And this token could be, it could be any type of underlying token as long as it meets this HTTPS API. Uh, and then we actually have the first sort of three level deep uh, set of microservices where we have a new repo that implements the ERC 1155 and, and kind of exposes it as this sort of well-known API that I've defined. Uh, and then underneath it is actually using ETH Connect, which ultimately uses Ethereum and an ERC 1155 based contract. So we have this whole stack uh, and we ended up needing kind of uh, an extra layer in here. This layer is very similar to the data exchange HTTPS layer, um, but then it's backed by ETH Connect. And just the last quick slide I'll show is uh, kind of where we're at, all the different pieces that are involved. Um, mostly what I've been working on, but certainly open to uh, other contributors that are interested in tokens, either on this plugin or uh, creating new plugins. Uh, there's a new component here called uh, Firefly Tokens ERC 1155. Uh, this is written in TypeScript because we feel that uh, there's kind of a wide base of TypeScript skills out there that um, may be able to get contributors on this or others. Uh, and then it deploys a, a Solidity contract that's ultimately deployed uh, onto Ethereum uh, and ETH Connect, kind of similar to some of our other blockchain work. And then, of course, the core work for Firefly is uh, underway right now. CLI support was just merged as of 0.0.29. Uh, and then we have these well-defined REST APIs at each layer. So a, a lot of different pieces kind of in flight here, and it's a very quick overview. But uh, if you're interested in knowing more about any of these pieces or contributing uh, in Go and TypeScript and Solidity, because uh, I could certainly use uh, experts on, on all of these uh, to help contribute, then please reach out to me or to Nico or on Rocket Chat, uh, and we can see where you can help out. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Andrew. And just uh, to, to kind of highlight and, and reinforce something that Andrew said, so that We've implemented so the, the decision to move or to introduce a token bridge is important uh, because we we do not want to provide an authoritative way to do tokens because tokens like everybody has a different way that they're going to want their particular token to work or they want their application to work with tokens. So this Firefly tokens ERC 1155 bridge that we are building we view as a reference implementation of here's how a token bridge can be built and how it connects to the rest of the Firefly ecosystem. It is not by any means an authoritative implementation on how tokens shall be built. Uh, that is completely up to the community or uh, anybody who, who wants to deploy Firefly and run it and customize it, they can drop in their, whatever implementation of bridge they want, whatever smart contract for uh, actually executing the token logic on the other side that they want. Uh, so we wanted it to be very modular and uh, that's that's why that that bridge piece exists there yeah exactly we really quickly just just want to say yeah. um so we we haven't started on the bridge yet though um just just the connector so the piece that does tokens um uh, uh fungible non-fungible tokens uh, a bridge which is um a piece that we're, we're talking about getting to down the road Sorry. which would be here, I've got tokens in my ecosystem. I want to bridge them to um, uh, another another ecosystem. So I just wanted to make sure no one was confused. Yeah, I may have overloaded the terms as well. So we may need to <laughs> yeah. connector versus bridge. So so in in the recording, we'll go edit everything I said and just find replace <laughs> with the connector. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Good good uh, call out there. Appreciate that. This is really exciting stuff. It's, it's I've been been watching the progress here, and it's um. It's going to be great to to have this have this in. It's it's we we talked about this like two really big legs of the stool, which are um, are, are needed before we're kind of together um, and sort of feeling like we're we're at sort of a an MVP level of functionality for for Firefly as a whole. And and um, uh, the, the the two big legs there are the the token capabilities because they're just so core to the programming of any blockchain application um and then also the um the fabrics part of this but the the sort of generic on-chain logic support and i did want to share that there's also a lot of work happening on that stat thread as well the fabric um 
work is really going great guns. It's at a similar level, but Jim's out this week. So I think um, I think there'll be an update on that one in the next the next one of these sessions. Yeah. Awesome. All right. I think that is it for updates. Uh, so with that, Peter, I will turn it over to you for our discussion on sequencing. Peter, you're on mute. I'm not sure if you intended to just mute yourself or that was accidental. Yeah, I totally intended to mute myself the last time I talked. Um, thanks, Nico. So we're, um, we, we did a, a session. Uh, it's the, the date's still on the slides, uh, 7th of July. And we talked about um, event sequencing in, in Firefly because it's, it's a pretty critical piece um, of what Firefly what Firefly does. Um, so we, we got um, through the basics um, and then we paused and we said, we'll come back to the details. So the, the idea today is to, to go down into the weeds, talk about privacy, how privacy and sequencing goes together, talk about the internal event model, um, the event bus that's inside of, uh, inside of Firefly, because it's, it's actually got quite a lot of a messaging system inside of inside of it. So we're going to go into that level of detail. But just in case there's anybody who doesn't have a perfect memory that spans multiple months, I thought it might be worth doing just two minutes at the beginning, um, catching up on on the background. And we'll try and finish this this session um, uh, at about 22. So leave some time for discussion still. OK, so sequencing um, the, the the reason why sequencing is such an important construct in any multi-party system um, is because it's actually under the covers, the building block that makes everything else possible. Um, scenarios like tokens um, work because you've got a shared history um, of or a shared transaction history. And um, they are massively powerful because they allow um, not just sophisticated on-chain constructs, they, um, they actually allow um, those on-chain constructs, even really, really simple ones like just ordering stuff, or more complicated ones like tokens, etc., to be coordinated with off-chain, real-world enterprise systems. So you can have um, your, you know, five parties in a network or, or three as we've got on the screen here, each one of them can have the core systems that they do have, right, that, that they've been building, building for the last 20, 40 years, depending on how, how big that, that organization is, that they've, they've got their existing systems of record. Um, they can join a multi-party system um, and they aren't, you know, let's not be over, under any illusions under, uh, over this, that they're not going to throw away all of what they're doing today, just because they've joined a multi-party system, but they are going to start doing something differently. And chances are they're going to get involved in a multi-party business process. They're going to start doing, they're going to try and solve a problem in a multi-organization way. And it's going to be um, it's going to involve some, some new steps, right? It's going to involve some agreed data formats being exchanged in an agreed sequence, uh, agreed decision points, whether they're automated or they're human, whether some of those decisions are shared logic, some of them are customizable logic. There's going to be this sort of set. And this is not a new problem. This is what um, any messaging system has been built for, for the whole of, whole of my career. But all previous messaging systems had this problem. I've got my sequence, you've got your sequence, we've got no agreed sequence. So we have to do really complicated things like compensation logic to deal with when your view of the world disagrees with my view of the world. Multi-party systems um, have this, this change agent in the middle of the blockchain that means that we don't need to do that. We can actually have a shared agreed sequence and we talked about the fact that there's just the one thing you have to do because it's 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 the blockchain you 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 need to process the the events in a way that you understand you're not the only person in the system 
So we used this picture and we talked about the fact that if you think about a Modi Party system like a funnel, lots of parties involved are trying to do things. They know the order in which they're doing them. Their system, their firefly, um, is knows that um, you know Bob and Sally here. Bob submitted event one, two, and three. Sally submitted event one, two, and three. We're used to that being, you know, very deterministic. You you make three, you submit three messages into your MQ or Kafka or whatever, or you make three REST API calls. You expect them to be processed in the order one, two, three. But in a multi-party system, the, the, the problem is you're not the only person submitting those. So they're being ordered alongside somebody else submitting events of the same type. And because we're decentralized, we haven't just got one central runtime here, we're decentralized, that means that those runtimes have to coordinate. And what happens um, with Fire and what Firefly is there to, one of the jobs that it solves, a building block that it provides on which you can build much more sophisticated solutions, is that um, it will take these balls sort of being thrown in. And you saw the, the fun ball graphic on slide one here, where everyone's in the playground, they're throwing the balls into the, into the hoop in the top and they're coming out the bottom. It will create one agreed sequence. It will receive the items in order from the multiple parties and it will create one agreed sequence. And you can see here that Bob's sequence is in the order that he submitted it. One, two, three. Sally's sequence is in the order that she submitted it. One, two, three. But they're intermingled. Um, and when you're thinking about building your business logic, this is hugely powerful because it means that you can both process these in the same order. So actually, Bob might request something to go into the top of the, the filter, but it's really quite important that he his application waits for it to be ordered and processes all of the things that go before it, before processing it. So you look at Sally's scenario. If Sally submits ball number one here, immediately assumes that it's the right next thing to do, that's incorrect. Because actually, Sally submitted ball number one, but actually her application needs to process Bob's ball number one and Bob's ball number two before actually processing hers. And we used the example before of a bid. Um, there's one, I think we, we used a crate of bananas. There's one crate of bananas there's a whole bunch of parties in the system bidding on that crate of bananas. Um, and if one of those parties says, look, I'm, I'm going to you know, submit the highest bid or I'm going to be the first, if it's first past the post, I'm going to be the first, first one to grab this thing. Um, you can assume that you've grabbed it just because you said grab, but actually you might not win the race. Um, so if you want to know, did you grab it, you need to check the state after your attempt was um, was was um, was submitted, and because we're decentralized, the processing has to happen either on the blockchain is one option, shared state, very difficult if you've got privacy involved, or everybody has to do the same processing and come up with the same the same answer, so you can run the same logic everywhere. So that's the summary of the problem we're trying to solve, um, the the core thing on which. You know, Bitcoin was built on, right? And 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 the evolution of the of, of of all things since is this concept that everybody can have an agreed sequence, and you layer the logic on top. And Firefly lets you layer the logic deterministically in the chain, but it also lets you layer the, layer the logic so that it's executed multiple times by different parties off chain. So we um, slightly more detailed picture of the previous um, that we went through um, last time, where you've got um, Bob's, Bob's got his Firefly node, which includes um, messaging for off-chain, includes IPFS for storing, um, storing broadcast data, it includes a database, it includes a blob store for, for storing data that, that could be, that's, you know, large documents, etc. There's the runtime with the API, um, and Bob can submit um, a green and then a red message. Um, Sally's got exactly the same stack in, in her. Firefly node over here, and, and she submits the blue message. Um, and they go into Firefly core, um, but it's very important that instead of just assuming that because you sent it, it's been sent, you need to wait for the confirmation. 
and the confirmations will come in a deterministic order and the order is assured to be the same for both um, Bob and Sally, red, blue, green. Now, I think a couple of weeks ago, um, we talked about there was a, a feature in flight in, um, in Firefly, but would allow this API call to block until this event comes back to your application. So to pause, so until it's been sequenced and all other um, events have been emitted that are before that. So to, to block, to stop your API call, make it wait. Let's say it takes five seconds, your API call will wait for five seconds until this has been sequenced. That's now in. Um, and there is a, a there has been a bit of a shuffle of the API um, that maybe we could go through um, next time, especially when tokens comes in. It might be worth us doing another review of the API in an upcoming session and just talk through it. But you can now send a message and say, confirm in a query parameter and your your that api call will block until it's been sequenced so that allows a mechanism a model of programming where you you submit it you blocked and then you can once that api calls returned you can go and ask for the state and say oh where are things where are things up to and you'll you'll know that you're you're checking the state after that action was was processed so that's 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 one that's one extra thing that's come in. But fundamentally, this is the core model of Firefly: is that you're you're submitting, but really, we, and we talked about event-driven programming a, a couple of sessions ago. Um, you really, rather than sort of thinking about blocking, the right way to write your application in ninety percent of cases, the right way is you are, you just have a listener in your app. That remember when we're talking about um, we were doing the the sort of um, event driven programming sort of 101 last time, you your app should be structured so that it submits actions. That's one act, one task it does, um, and it says thank you very much, um, and then it processes events and it's just continually listening to events. That's the best way to write applications in the vast majority of circumstances. Okay, so that was the that was the catch up. Um, now we're just going to go an, another level deeper, and we're going to lift lift the lift the the, the bonnet or hood um, on the on the engine, and we're going to look at how the internals of Firefly are structured to kind of make all this possible. And then we're going to talk about how the heck we do it in a privacy preserving way as well. Um, and, and those of you um, who, who sort of are, are more on the sort of protocol deeper side might, might find that last piece pretty, pretty interesting. So this is a summary um, picture of the internals of Firefly that, um, that are responsible um, for um, making the last slide true. And um, it's basically a messaging engine, um, this piece of the code. It's probably one of the heaviest lifting pieces of the code because, as I've said before, it, it's the one thing that can only be done in the Firefly layer because it's about coordinating together things that happen on the blockchain, things that arrive over messaging, things that are available on IPFS, it coordinates them all together. And that means that it, it can't be in any one of those technologies. It has to be in the orchestrator. So this is one of the reasons why this is a big piece of heavy, heavy lifting in Firefly, is because Firefly is the orchestrator for this sort of on-chain, off-chain coordinated sequencing. And um, so we've got, we've got Sally's app here, um, and Sally, does a post of a of a of a broadcast in this particular um, uh, um, scenario. If you don't specify the confirm true, so the default mode of operation and the mode of operation I'd encourage for the majority of use cases, you're going to get an acknowledgement with a um, it's 202 rather than 201. Apologies for the, the, the incorrect slide here. You're going to 202 accept it back straight away. As soon as that message has just been written to a local messages 
table. So there's a database table, and this is a summary of it. This isn't meant to be the full database scheme, it's just enough to give you an idea. Um, and it has a local sequence, really critical to understand that this sequence is only useful within my local Firefly. And the reason why Sally's Firefly needs to keep a record of her sequence is because this Firefly needs to make sure that it submits it into the blockchain for global sequencing in the same order that Sally submitted it. It would be a crazy weird system if when Sally submitted um, message one, two, and three, then Sally's messages ended up getting ordered on the blockchain, message 213, right? That would just be really hard for any programmer to, to work against. So Firefly needs to be absolutely certain locally that it knows the order in which messages were submitted by the apps connected to the local Firefly. And it does that by putting it into a message table. And that's all it is. Um, when you do send, it just goes to a local database table and that API call is done. It's done. Um, the next step is that the batch processor kicks in. Um, and the reason why we have a batch processor is that from the previous generations and production deployments there, we realized that these technologies, blockchain, and even more so technologies like IPFS, are not designed to create very high throughput um, by, by um, submitting lots and lots of individual things sequentially, particularly something like IPFS. If you, if you take tiny packages of like a kilobyte of data and you submit a thousand of them, um, that will take time X of some number of milliseconds. If you submit one 1,000 kilobyte piece of data to IPFS, it's not going to take um, the same amount of time. It's actually going to take maybe only, um, it's maybe only going to take um, a, a tiny fraction of the time it would take to submit all of those individually, because they have to be propagated to everybody. Everybody has to go and download each of these. And, and, and you're, you're being very inefficient in how you use the technologies. So Firefly comes with a, a batch processor built, built in. And the batch processor listens um, using a database listener. Um, uh, there's another sort of detailed point about where we are on the journey to an active-active runtime for, for Firefly, but this is all designed with active-active in, in mind, even though we actually only support a single runtime at the moment for each Firefly node. Um, the, the batch processors gets a tap on the shoulder to say, hey, look, there's more messages in the messages table. And it's constantly trying to aggregate those together. And there are options on here, like how long do you want to wait? Um, and how what's the maximum number of messages you'll put into an individual batch? So maybe wait for up to half a second to fill up a batch. So delay any individual message by up to half a second to allow friends to join it and allow maybe 500 to, 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 to join to join it. So, so that would be an example of sort of configuration on the batch processor. Can't remember what the defaults are, but it's in the order of what I just, just described. And, and it, it, it go, spins around um, uh, assembling a batch and the batches are on the REST API. So you can see the batches and it updates the individual messages with the ID of the batch that they've been popped inside of. So that's that's what happens when you're globally sequencing. None of this happens if you're just doing completely unpinned private sends to somebody. But when it's being pinned to the blockchain, it's, it, we call it a batch pin transaction. It gets assembled along with a bunch of its friends into a batch. Each of these gets updated with a batch, um, a, a batch. And then um, once the batch is ready for dispatch, it gets what we call sealed. So all of the, all of the hashes, et cetera, get generated. So it can't be changed from that point on. And, um, and then it gets written, the full data of the batch gets written to, um, to, to storage or sent across private messaging. 
Um, and the blockchain gets a tiny transaction, a teeny tiny transaction, which has just got enough proof that you can tie it back to the batch. Um, and, that, and that's the key thing is that the blockchain is the sequencer. So the blockchain has to put it in the right order. The blockchain does not need to contain the data. So the blockchain has, this is the batch in this order and IPFS or, or private off-chain exchange um, sends that batch um, across. Okay, so that's what send looks like. Very simple, goes into a local database, um, table gets assembled into a batch and then gets sent to public storage and, and blockchain. That's actually the easy bit, right? Um, that's the easy bit. The complicated bit is that now this blockchain transaction is being ordered with all kinds of other transactions going to the system from all kinds of parties. Um, and um, the data is going to arrive at a completely different time. If it's IPFS, then it should be there and you have to sort of suck it down. If it's um, data exchange, it's going to be in a messaging system, right? It's going to be flowing asynchronously at the right, at the right time to get across to you. So what we actually need is we now need an aggregator. Um, and this aggregator, um, I, I, I don't have time to go into all of the real nitty gritty of how this works. This is actually quite a lot of code inside of Firefly, but the aggregator um, one gets started basically, um, and its job in the world um, is to listen um, for to all of the arrivals that could happen and work out if that caused something that wasn't complete to be complete. Um, and the reason I was choosing all those words is um, the blockchain stuff can arrive at any time. The, don't know the, the data exchange data can arrive at any time. The public storage data needs to be sucked in. So um, the way that it actually works is when blockchain events come in, um, there's a listener that's part of the connector for that particular blockchain. So ETH Connect is the connector for Ethereum, Fab Connect is the connector for, for Fabric. So separate runtimes, just like the token connector that we were talking about earlier today, earlier for, from Andrew. Um, the blockchain connector is just listening reliably for events, but it needs to it needs to accept those events as they come in and just say yes, 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 yes. So um, all the blockchain connector does is write those into what we call the pins table, and we'll talk a little bit about what a pin is uh, in the in the next in the next um, slide. It writes it to the pins table, um, and the inbound data aggregator is listening to the pins table as well as listening for private data and the data aggregator is responsible for um, maintaining basically this dispatched column on the pins table and it uses this to say like something new comes comes in a new blockchain piece comes in is it complete do i have all of the data um, what sequence is it on? And we've talked in the past about this sort of subsequences, these topics where you can say, you know, block the world on this particular topic if you know you're missing an event, but don't, but don't block others. So it, 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 it fills these up and it, they go from sort of false to true. And as soon as it goes from false to true on one, which can only happen if all the data is available and there's no previous pins which are in false state, they're not complete on the same sequence. The inbound data aggregator just writes a new event to an events table. So it's very database coupled. Um, and that's part, that's, there's a couple of reasons why this is so database coupled. One is the high availability model, because it means we can run active active runtimes on top of the database. The other is that unlike many messaging systems, the goal of Firefly is you can query all state from time zero at any point. 
So these, these, the, the fact that you sent all of these messages, the events themselves that are coming in, um, they they are all written in perpetuity. They're, they're never they're never deleted, and that's very different to a traditional Kafka or MQ messaging system, which is like maintaining a little really super fast buffer to just transport things in flight. This is about a complete history of time. So that's why we use we use a, um, a database here and we try to be as efficient as we can. And I'm sure there'll be more optimization in the coming months um, on that usage of the database. So you've then got the events table and the events, <clears throat> there's only one event. Even if you've got multiple applications listening to those to those, um, you know, those yellow balls that were coming in from Sally and the blue ones coming in from from Bob, you might have five applications all connected to the same Firefly that want to listen. There's still only one event that gets written into the, the events table. Otherwise, it would be very inefficient on the database. And the events are just a pointer back to the messages and the data. So we don't write the big stuff multiple times, but we do need these little records of here's a sequenced event. And the absolute truth in Firefly of the sequence of events is this table. Because remember, we talked about they go in, they get sequenced, and they come back. This wire here, when they've been sequenced, and it's going to be the same on both sides, that's the events table. So the last piece of the puzzle here, and we may we may pause at the end of this and see if for questions and see if we want to come on to the privacy preserving preserving piece because it's even more. It's a little bit more complicated um, than, than this. Um, the subscription manager is the last piece. And the subscription manager um, is responsible for starting and stopping what are called event dispatches. And, um, a, and this is because you might have multiple applications interested in the same message, um, same event. A very obvious example of this is if I've got a copy of the Firefly Explorer running and you've got a copy of the Firefly Explorer running on your laptop, we're both developing against the same Firefly server. Obviously, we both need a copy of the message. It's not going to be very useful if if like my UI updates one time and then randomly yours UI uh, updates another time and we're seeing different updates. That seems really, really weird. Well, it's exactly the same for applications. If you've got um, if you've got multiple instances of the same application, you might want messages to be workload balanced between them, or you might want each one of those applications to get a copy of the of the of the message. And we talked about durable versus non durable um, or named versus ephemeral applications in the, in the previous talk. Um, so so what? the subscription manager does is it maintains these event dispatches and the event dispatches are started when the application is listening. So if you've got an application when it connects a, a, across a webhook, that connection goes into Firefly, the subscription manager kicks off an event dispatcher for your particular connection on the webhook. If you've got an application that wants just one copy of the message that might open multiple web sockets into into firefly then um there's a leader election that happens so that only one event dispatch will get will get get started and and, and that becomes the the leader uh, and all messages will go to that one application instance that app that connection disconnects and it goes to the other for web hooks which is a push model there's one event dispatcher um, for all webhooks, and it's just receiving them and then pushing them to as many webhooks as, as, as are needed. So that's the event dispatches. In terms of how it works inside of the databases, um, we don't have lots of copies of the events. The events exist exactly once, but the events, just like the messages, have a local sequence that we know what order they're in inside of the database. So all we need to maintain in each subscription is a pointer, an offset, really, really well-established pattern in messaging. Um, we just maintain an offset where a particular subscription knows where it's up to in the sequence of events. Subscriptions can also have filters applied, um, um, and that's fine. All it does is you just go through these messages one by one by one, 
um, saying, does it match? Does it match? If it does match, it needs, there needs to be an event dispatcher ready to process it. If it, um, if it doesn't match, it's just, we just move the pointer forwards regardless. Um, so that's, so this is kind of like the messaging engine of, um, of Firefly in a, in a nutshell. This piece is the more complicated piece because it's about assembling, dealing with all of the different paradigms for how subscribers need to work against, against an application. Um, and it's got to aggregate together multiple sources of data. Um, the sending side, um, the more complicated bit is the batching, which is how we're able to get a higher throughput out of um, IPFS more than anything else for broadcast, but also messaging systems and blockchains as well.